What's happening, everyone? Welcome into episode 65 of the Two Stripes Podcast, the podcast that covers everything happening in the world of college football. My name is Colton Denning, and I am your host. Hope you are all having a great week as we cruise into the weekend, one of the best weekends in sports. The NCAA tournament just started, got underway today. My bracket's already done. I had Yale and Vermont in the Sweet 16. I'm an idiot. My bracket's busted, so I'm hoping for some other upsets so everybody's screwed just like me. Aside from that, I'm doing pretty well, and I hope that you are too. I also want to thank you for listening to the show, whether you are a first-time listener or a returning listener. If you like the show, please head to soundcloud.com slash two stripes pod and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts. If you just search the Two Stripes Podcast, you can find it there and leave a review, leave a rating. Big shout out to whoever the anonymous hero was after last week's show for leaving a rating. I was at 11, now I'm at 12 ratings. So whoever you are, I appreciate that. Send me a tweet at Dubsco so I can thank you personally for that one because it really does help people find the show and it means a lot when people say they like the show. So much appreciated and I hope that this episode is as good as how I thought uh, last episode was. On the subject of today's show, I'm sticking in the ACC and talking about Georgia Tech. And there's no better place to talk about Georgia Tech athletics than over at FromTheRumbleSeat.com. So I snagged one of their contributors, Nishant Prasad, for an interview last week where we talked everything Yellow Jackets and this new regime and all of these massive changes to the program that are going on there. You know, when a coach leaves or a coach gets fired or whatever it may be, whenever a new staff comes into play, the cliche is always like, oh, this is going to be brand new. Everything is different. We're headed in a different direction. We're, we're starting over. And I think to a certain degree, that's true almost everywhere. You change schemes, you, you change coaches, you change certain things the way you want to do stuff. But in a situation like this, where Paul Johnson was there for over a decade, he had been running the triple option. There was a very specific type of player and way that they wanted to play. And a lot revolved around that triple option. And now with Jeff Collins from the X's and O's to the schemes on both sides of the ball, the type of players they want to recruit, the way that they want to recruit, the way they use social media Everything about the program as of right now has completely changed and everything is brand new for Georgia Tech. So it was fun to hear Nishant talk about how that transition is going, why you should probably temper any sort of expectations for year one given that everything's going to be brand new, and a little bit about what the ceiling is at Georgia Tech and the vision for the program that Jeff Collins has. This was a super fun interview to record. I learned a lot about Georgia Tech. I hope you do too. And if you're a Georgia Tech fan listening, I hope that we did this one justice. So let's get right to it. I'm going to stop flapping my beak right now. Here is Nishant Prasad of From the Rumble Seat. I am very excited to be talking about a brand new look Georgia Tech team with one of the contributors from from the rumble seat.com and his name is Nishant Prasad. Nishant, how you doing, man? Doing all right. How you doing? I'm doing well. I am this is one of the, uh, like this is one I've really been looking forward to because people don't talk about Georgia Tech a lot and you know for obviously the past decade or so, I guess 11 years of Paul Johnson, almost all of that talk was focused on the option and how how crazy he was and how, how different he was. And now with Jeff Collins taking over and this being the first year, it really feels like, I don't want to say refreshing because that that goes to like, oh, Paul Johnson was bad, which, you know, he wasn't. But it's just it's just a new look for Georgia Tech. How has it been for the fan base coming to grips with like, we're about to see something totally different that we haven't seen in a long time. You know, it's been interesting. I think everyone is excited just for different reasons. Um, you know, toward the end of the Paul Johnson era, it kind of reached this point where it, it was almost split into factions. You know, there was the group that wanted Paul Johnson out. They'd wanted him out for years. They were just sick of the offense or sick of his personality or whatever. And there were the others who, um, you know, kind of looked at him and said, you know, there's 
it, the reasons that we've been struggling are, you know, they aren't really all on Paul Johnson. But, you know, the thing that it's interesting because Collins has he's just brought so much energy to the program. It's a completely different feel. You know, Paul was very he, he had a great personality in that, you know, he just didn't take crap from anyone. Um, and, you know, that was just his whole thing. But Collins is just he's so excited. He's just so excitable. He's, you know, constant energy all the time. Um, and you know, it's just, it's gotten people excited. So I think, um, you know, like ticket numbers are up for next year. Um, it's going to be weird just, you know, with the transition on offensively, as well as on defense, we're going from a three, four back to a four, three, but you know, just, yeah, I think, I think everyone is, 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 um, you know, one way or another, they're looking forward to seeing what happens this fall. The main thing everybody's going to talk about is the offense and the transition of schemes. Mm -hmm. And you even mentioned the defense too switching up their schemes but it's like you said the personality between these two guys and even you can see it in the way that Georgia Tech runs their social media now it seems like it's been a lot more of what we see from a lot of other teams around the country a lot more focus on using those mediums to attract talent and given where they are and where they're situated it doesn't seem like a bad strategy what what's that been like to watch Georgia Tech kind of undergo a shift so so quickly on that front it's kind of jarring if i'm completely honest um you know we've gone from you know being very just clean cookie cutter uh, you know just put what we need put what we need to out there in the media and not much more to you know just pumping out you know all the just hashtags left and right um i'm even a little bit curmudgeonly and some of them just make me sigh <laughs> with some of the things he's come up with but um, no, it's, it's really been fascinating because, you know, it's just to see how, um, his sort of brand and, you know, Colin's big thing is branding and just, yeah, the way he's tackled it, you know, embracing Atlanta is the biggest thing and just the cultural thing there. So uh, I don't know if you've seen just like the way that, you know, he's, he's always talking about Atlanta, you know, wearing various different caps, always carrying around that Waffle House cup. There is a yep. fun story actually related to from the rebel seat behind that one. But, you know, it's really been fascinating just the way that, you know, he's all about, you know, just talking up the program, um, talking up ties to the city bring excitement back. He brought back a lot of his new coaching staff has a lot of um, former players on it. So, you know, that's been kind of cool to see um, guys like to choice coming home and, and Brent key coming over from Alabama. He's another former player. So yeah, it's just been, it, it, it's, it's been really fascinating. Like, you know, just, I didn't, I wouldn't have thought, you know, just the kind of approach he's taken would be something that I would see at a tech program. Cause you know, I really only started following at the beginning of the Paul Johnson era, which is when I first enrolled. So, you know, that's all I've ever really known. And just going from that to this, it's jarring, but it's also kind of fascinating. Tashar Choice, very overlooked running back and a, uh, a great pregame speech giver as well. I think that some of those old ones are out on <laughs> out on YouTube. I know YouTube. the one you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, it's a classic. If you're not a Georgia Tech fan, uh, go on YouTube and just search Tashar Choice pregame speech. It's one of the better ones you will ever hear. But on that note about recruiting and kind of, I guess, just the different energy at any place when there's a coaching change, you see that you're going to have a switch up in the philosophy and the mm -hmm. types of players that are going to be recruited. But in a situation like this, where you're literally changing a, a whole system from the ground up and just going after a different type of player, has there been any indication from the coaches about what type of player they're looking for and what the blueprint for their recruiting is going to be? To an extent. And, you know, we're kind of piecing it together in some on some level from the sort of guys they're targeting now. So, you know, on offense, you know, as you said, of course, with the offensive transition, everything is changing. So, you, you know, uh, recently, I think it was uh, just late last week, we got our first commitment from a pro style quarterback, at least one classified as a pro style quarterback on the recruiting sites. The first one since, I believe, 2007 or 2008. Um, the last one was Stephen Three, if you want to have a wow. name from way, way back. But yeah, it's the other, you know, obviously Paul Johnson always going after those dual threat guys. Um, it's going to be different at pretty much every position. Um, you know, running backs will, we, we just um, very late in the class, um, Collins brought in a guy named Jamius Griffin. He, he was a four star running back, the brother of a guy who's currently on the roster. And, you know, that was really a sign that, you know, hopefully recruiting will start to have an uptick for us in terms of the talent level. But yeah, just in terms of positions, um, we've, started bringing in tight ends, um, brought in a guy in 
this most recent class, as well as a graduate transfer, just recently got a commitment from another tight end for 2020. Tight ends are back on the menu. We're going to be looking at uh, different types of receivers now. You know, Paul Johnson would always focus on, you know, really big, tall, uh, tall receivers with good size, you know, guys who could block well on the edge, win jump balls downfield. That was kind of, you know, the the way the passing game worked. Now we're looking at, you know, a wider variety of guys. So more of these like small guys who can fit in the slot guys who would have played slot or a back um, or the slot back position in the Paul Johnson offense. Um, But, you know, would be reasonable fits in in the slot at receiver. And then on the offensive line, we're kind of moving away from the smaller, more agile guys that Johnson targeted Collins um, and offense corner Dave Pottenode are looking Looking to go from you know bigger guys, more of a power run game seems to be what they're aiming for. So yeah, that's offense. So yeah, kind of like I said, everything is different across the board. Um, on defense, you know, we, I, I mentioned the scheme change. Um, we had run a four three under Ted Roof from 2013 through 2017, and then the past year we went to a three four with Nate Woody. Um, he was looking for more uh, kind of smaller guys, you know, with an emphasis on you know just kind of busting through, disrupting plays in the backfield. Uh, partly because of the personnel fit, partly because of the transition. It just didn't work too well in Woody's one season. And now we've got um, Collins has brought over most a lot of his defensive assistants from Temple, including um, co-coordinators Andrew Thacker and Nate Burton. And, um, yeah, so those guys are going to go back to a 4-3. So, you know, we're, a lot of the linemen we already had on the roster should translate more. But, um, yeah, so there'll be some differences at um, – linebacker along the line but cl- less than we're seeing on offense i guess uh steven three was not a name i was going to i was expecting to hear right. today shout out to the rich rodriguez era at michigan saw that one up close and it was it was a lot of fun for uh for me um <laughs> on the on the offense it's it's just hard to know because we got to wait till spring practice and, and even the spring game to really understand where they're going to go forward with this and what this new offense is going to look like. But who are some of the playmakers and who are who are some of the guys that stand out as, hey, this is going to be a key contributor this season? So, yeah, it's uh, there's a few guys we can kind of point to. So the good news is there's a good number of running backs from the Johnson era who are coming back and should translate pretty well. So I'd say one guy to watch out for is the guy who was the starting B-back at the beginning of last season, um, Curvante Benson. He's a small, just really uh, small, but really stout running back with good vision, um, good agility. He did um, have an injury last year. I'm blanking on what exactly it was, but it was a season ending injury back in September. Um, if he recovers well, he should translate pretty well to just about any off any sort of offensive scheme that we run. So he's one to keep an eye on. The same thing for Jordan Mason, um, who was the B-back who took over for uh, Benson as a starter after he went out. At wide receiver is going to be a bit of a question mark. I think this is an area where there will be a lot of potential for young guys to contribute. Uh, The biggest names returning are Jalen Camp and Malachi Carter. Carter in particular, I think, will be um, has the best chance to be a big contributor in the offense this coming fall. He is he's just a receiver with good length, um, good athleticism, um, contributed a lot as a true freshman. So he's got to watch on the outside. And quarterback, uh, the offensive line is just a series of question marks. That is going to be the that's sort of the biggest concern going in. And at quarterback, the two guys to watch out for, we don't know who's going to start right now. Um, actually, I should say three names. So Tobias Oliver was the main backup last year. Um, he, you may have seen him on Thursday night bludgeoning Virginia Tech for 49 points. That was <laughs> unexpected and beautiful. Bud Foster, their defense coordinator, has always given us trouble. But... Um, yeah, so Oliver is the only returning guy with experience, but there's a guy a year ahead of him, Lucas Johnson, who was injured last season, but he is probably the best passer on the roster right now. And the other name I would point to is a, an incoming true freshman, Jordan Yates. He was a high three, low four star guy who won a state title at Milton High School. He's just he's just an incredibly polished prospect. We all feel on the staff that he was really underrated. Um, and, you know, there's definitely a chance that he could, you know, Come, come in and take the job right away. So Jeff Collins has a very strong identity on offense and a very strong background, or on, on defense, excuse me. <laughs> and Temple's defense finished 42nd in S&P Plus on defense last year was very good. And you look at Tex, they finished 100th. What's the ideal identity of this defense in year one when they're kind of just figuring out who they have and how to piece it together? You know, I'll be honest, I just want to pass rush again. That's the biggest <laughs> thing I care about. It has... The last time Tech had a decent pass rush was probably 
2013 or 2014. Like it, it's just Jeremiah Tauchu was the last really good true pass rusher we had. Um, he graduated after the 2013 season. Um, so, you know, if they can just establish just winning in the trenches has been, the, is the biggest thing that I want to see. And I think that is something that Collins has kind of emphasized at his defenses, you know, just finding really good athletes to put up front. So, you know, hopefully that is a major point of emphasis for them. Um, got some decent linemen coming back. But we'd like, yeah, who is rushing the pass? There's still a huge question mark. Other than that, you know, Collins, I think his biggest strength is in the secondary. That's exciting because that is by far the most talented position group, probably on the entire roster. We've recruited that, recruited cornerback and safety really well the past two, three years. Um, got a lot of really talented young guys who are kind of coming into their own now. Um, so, you know, I feel like, uh, secondary coaching has been kind of a weakness for the team the last couple of years, and I'm excited to see what Collins and Burton and some of these guys can do with some of the guys we got, like Trey Swilling at cornerback, Juan A. Thomas and Charlie Thomas at safety. There's a lot of very, very talented guys who are, you know, just, uh, sophomore, uh, freshmen and sophomores really that, um, and so I, you know, I, I really enjoy, um, just following defensive backs in general. So I'm hoping that, you know, those guys can take a step forward. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I kind of wandered off in, uh, while trying to answer your question, but you know, what I want to see as a pass rush, um, what I hope we'll see is, you know, just a lockdown secondary, um, that kind of helps to build up, it, you know, it's usually get a good pass rush and that helps your secondary out. I'm hoping we can so kind of see a lot of the, a little bit of the opposite as well, if that makes sense. Yeah. I was going to ask you, where do you think that they're going to end up being the best at defensively? And it seems like the, the secondary is the, the easiest answer, at least for right now. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely the one that has the highest ceiling in the short term. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, it's sort of, I think Collins has, on some of his past teams, has coached either the cornerbacks or safeties or both himself. The assistants he's brought in there are pretty good. So I think that should be the strength. Linebacker is the one I'm kind of most concerned about. We, uh, you know, it was kind of a weakness last year as well. We've got some decent uh, prospects there, but it's you know, not as much of a sure thing. Whenever I would watch Georgia Tech, and if it were a game where they kind of got ran on or a team was just having success offensively, invariably there'd always be the color commentator who would say, well, you know, this defense just looks tired and they have to go against this triple option in practice every day and you just wonder how much that takes out of them. Do you put any stock into those guys not having to practice and, and see that offense every single day as that being a, a place where they can, like a secret place they can improve in? I, I really don't think so. I think, you know, maybe a little, you know, because they, they do run into it in practice, but, you know, every team in the country uses a scout team to prep for a team. So, I you know, I think that's just kind of, I don't know how that storyline came up. Maybe there's a little truth through it, but I think it's kind of um, overblown. I I think the struggles have more been um, kind of on the coaching and player development side, if anything. Um, you know, we've usually had decent talent, you know, not necessarily um, enough in recent years to go up against Clemson and Georgia. They're just, those those kind of teams are outclassing us in talent right now. But, you know, defensively, there's there's really no reason we, we can't be better than we are. Um, and, you know, I'm hopeful that, you know, with a, a new coaching staff in place, you know, going back, back to 4-3, I think we recruit a little better to that, um, or even a 4-2-5 system to get uh, more, you know, an extra defensive back on the field. Yeah, I I don't think there's much to the, um, you know, the going against in practice thing. You know, we'd see this, we'd hear the same thing um, when the offense was struggling. They just like, oh, the defense has figured it out. No, they're just playing good defense. <laughs> but yeah, I... I don't put too much stock in it, I guess, to ultimately answer your question. Um, maybe there's a little to it, but I think just getting better coaching in there will help more. So to go off of the path a little bit from what we've been talking about on the field and in terms of how everything is just going to look philosophically for the program, in doing my research for this, I saw that they locked down a deal to play five games at Mercedes-Benz Stadium in the next six seasons. What's the, the fan base's feeling about that? And just reading into it, Whenever people talk about Georgia Tech from the outside, I feel like it's always, oh, they're maybe not a sleeping giant, but like, oh, they should always be better. They're, they're in Atlanta. They're in the, the heart of this recruiting hub. But Georgia Tech faces a lot of, I think, hurdles that other teams, even in the ACC, don't face, you know, despite being in the, in the position in the part of the, the state and the country where they are. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll just the second point first. So yeah, it's um, there are there are some challenges. I think uh, personally, um, I kind of place a different priority on some of them compared to others. So the biggest ones are you know there's 
academic restrictions, um, that, um, you know, the whole idea that we have a very limited selection of majors. And so if you're, ch- you're if you're chasing recruits that, you know, are very focused on their education, uh, that kind of restricts you. Like if we wanted a guy who wanted to study liberal arts, you know, chances are he's not going to find a program he likes at tech or we have some liberal arts majors, but it's kind of limited in that area. But I think the biggest thing, the bigger thing is really, you know, you mentioned the fact that we're in Atlanta and of course, you know, we really need to, it, it, you would think, you know, a school right in the heart of Atlanta, it would just recruit itself. Um, and that is a useful tool, but the thing is, it just Georgia in general has become such a recruiting hotbed. And you know, if you look at the school, the schools that recruit Georgia heavily, you're looking at Georgia, Florida, um, Florida State, South Carolina, Clemson, Tennessee, Alabama, Auburn. I just named off eight schools. Six of them are SEC schools. And when you grow up in Georgia, you hear SEC all the time, every day. That is all anyone cares about. Georgia is obviously the big name in the state. And so when you're trying to sell an ACC program right in the heart of SEC country, I, I would almost argue that's a bigger challenge than even the academic side. And yeah, actually, so to tack on one more that I'll actually circle back to your question about the Mercedes-Benz games. Um, another challenge that we've had recently is just finances. Um, you know, we one of the one thing that Paul Johnson complained about many times in the like first two thirds of his tenure was we just didn't have the personnel on the recruiting staff to really go out and get the guys he wanted to target. Um, it was there was a point where you know we we were we had the same level of personnel as Georgia State you know, a, a Sunbelt program. So, you know, that's that's inexcusable for an ACC team that wants to compete. Um, and, you know, it was it was partly just at that time we had a terrible athletic director. Um, the new guy has, you know, invested a lot more in the program, but we're also dealing with just like a really sort of ugly financial situation where, um, you know, we're trying to work through a lot of debt. And so I think that's sort of where this um, deal for the Mer- the games at Mercedes-Benz Stadium came from. You know, it's it's very polarizing on the fan base. Truthfully, I'm not even sure how I feel about it. It's cool to play games there, but it's also like, you know, we, we're giving up we're at least one one ACC game, possibly up to three, that, you know, should be played at Bobby Dodd. And that just doesn't sit that well with me. Giving up what, should, what would be a home conference game, um, and especially Clemson is going to, you know, pack that house, um, even if he... Um, have our season ticket holders there. So it's it's an interesting time. I think the, one of the big drivers in it was, you know, just trying to, you know, get some additional revenue. And it does help us sort of play into this idea of really marketing to Atlanta. If you're playing a game um, every year at that stadium, that'll sell on recruiting. You know, hopefully you can pick up some additional fans along the way. So, you know, it, it's part of the transition. It's really not, you know, the big thing in our transition is on the field with the scheme changes. But Everything's changing off the field too, and it's it's a lot to process in one off season. I think those are all great points, and and for me as an Ohio State fan, it's just hey, get out there, sell the brand, or really, it just sells itself. So to hear, you know, it's a good reminder that it's it's more you need to do more, especially at a place like Georgia Tech, than hey, just just go out and and get people excited and win football games. Like there there's so many more things that go into this whole vacuum of what it takes to build a successful football program and to keep it going, let alone just, just get it started to where you want to be and right. something like that. And it, it's just crazy. And then I, I think you, you brought up a great point about the state of Georgia and how many schools and how many top level schools are really just hitting that state hard for talent. Even, even Ohio state was able to get a kid like Raquan McMillan or now Isaiah Pryor, and just have like if you're Georgia Tech and you have all of these schools that are winning national championships going to you know these these Power Five New Year's Day games, it's it's hard. It's hard for anybody to compete in that sort of that sort of climate, especially with the way recruiting is. So you got to be able to to stand out. And it seems like when we circle back around to talking about Jeff Collins, that's what he's trying to do is differentiate. Georgia Tech from others in, in ways that they kind of haven't been differentiated before. Right. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. It's he's bringing something to the program that honestly, probably in, in my lifetime, I haven't really had um, is, to, you know, just really just enthusiastically selling the program, you know, selling Atlanta, going, go trying to establish a foothold. You know, with Paul Johnson, it was he he found guys who were good fits in his system, and he was really good at you know getting guys to play sort of above their ability level. But um, he, 
he didn't go in, he didn't really like, you know, try to get in the trenches and fight for a lot of recruits. Some of it is kind of what I alluded to earlier with, um, you know, the fact that he just didn't have the resources he needed. And that's, a, that's completely fair. But there were also times when, you know, we wonder like, you know, we probably should even with all that taken into consideration and be recruiting at a better level than we are. Um, and I think Collins has basically thrown down the gauntlet and said, no, we're go we're, we're going to just, we're going to, we're going to fight and we're going to get who we can. Um, and, um, it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Early indications are he's already made some inroads. Um, so the good news is Collins actually has, he's got a lot of connections to, um, Atlanta and Georgia going back. So he grew up, um, I think I'm forgetting which town, which town specifically, but in the Metro Atlanta area. Um, so, you know, he's, he's, he's familiar with the territory. He has been an assist, he was an assistant at tech a couple times. Um, once during the George O'Leary era for a couple of years. And then he was actually um, the director of player personnel, I believe, um, in 2006 for Chan Gailey. And he, from what I understand, was pretty instrumental in putting together that tech recruiting class, which the 2007 tech class was, I think, far and away the best we've ever had. That had a bunch of guys who you know went on to be stars in college in the NFL, Joshua Nesbitt, um, Jonathan Dwyer and Morgan Burnett, uh, Derek Morgan, uh, other names just in that class. And he was, yeah, so just like knowing that Collins was part of that, seeing the energy he's bringing to it, seeing the approach he's taken, it's it's prom it, it's just promising to see on the surface. And you know, it's obviously he hasn't coached a game yet. Um, he's just barely wading into his first full class. So you know, we'll see what he can do. But I think there's there's a lot of hope right now. And even for the people who you know were big Johnson supporters, it was you know it, toward the end it was just kind of like you know we we had a, a sense of what our ceiling was. And now it's you know let's. Why do we have to accept that? Let's see. Let's see where we can go. You know. Usually at the end of these episodes, these preview episodes, I'll I'll ask what expectations are for the upcoming season. But they're undergoing such a shift, and it's so early in the process. Right. I don't really think it's fair. But what are a couple of things that you really want to see from Tech, not only leading up to the year, but see from them in season? Yeah, it's as you have alluded to. It's tough to really have any solid expectations. I think the biggest thing we just want to see is progress. You know, no one's really expecting that much out of this first year. Um, just, you know, installing a new offense where everything will be different. Um, you know, switching back to going back, having our third defensive coordinator in three years. Yeah, it's it's hard to expect, you know, a lot of success out of this team. But I think if we see growth as the year goes on, you know, if we see like offensive linemen hitting their assignments late in the season, um, you know, quarterbacks making good decisions in the passing game, um, getting some of our receivers, more of our receivers and tight ends involved. It just made just, you know, good decisions, smart play, I think is what we want to see out of the gate because we've got some smart players on the roster. And, you know, as long as they're growing, it, it was, we kind of saw guys plateau a lot of times with, I think this is more of a problem on defense, especially, but it was also like on the offensive line and such. And, you know, we just, we just want to see improvement as time goes on. So, you know, I think the the ceiling we would expect in this first year is probably something like yeah, getting to a bowl game would be great. Um, I think that'd be a really good sign going forward. And there, I think I think there's you know more than enough talent to do that. It'd be more a question of just how quickly they pick things up. Um, anything beyond that is a bonus. I think you know years two and three are where we will really start to, you know, actually expect them to start competing in the coastal. Or yeah, I mean, actually, honestly, maybe that's even early for that. But you know, the year three is when we hope to start competing, and then you know from there. I think it's at that point it's Collins' team. Well, one one thing we probably aren't going to see is as many crazy quotes as we got from uh, <laughs> from Paul Johnson, but we will see a lot of Waffle House and we'll see a lot of shotgun. Yeah. So two things here. One, I think you'll see a lot of crazy quotes just in a different sort of <laughs> a different, in a different way. Johnson got. Two, um, I'm going to throw a fun story to you just because I want to get it out there. Um, Let's do it about about Waffle House specifically. So um, back when Johnson retired. Um, we did a series on uh, coaching candidates for you know, just, you know, kind of spitballing some names that, you know, it either come up in the media or, you know, guys that we'd be interested in. And one name that came up was Jeff Collins. And initially, you know, it seemed kind of lukewarm, like, OK, this guy has been a head coach for two years at Temple. He won eight games a second year. Um, good defensive record. But, you know, we don't really know what to expect for him. And then Cade Lawson, uh, one of our site managers, comes across this video 
of, and you probably, you might know the one I'm talking about, the video of Jeff Collins. Um, while he was at Temple, it was called uh, Cheese Steaks with Coach. And he took yeah. them across the state board of Maryland to Waffle House. And Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, so just that, that sold all of us immediately. Um, and so the next day, um, we published the article, and um, I was the one writing this. So just as a goofy thing at the end, I wrote this, like, minute by minute breakdown of like, you know, pretending to film critique it. So I'm saying like, you know, when he lays out his order, I'm like, you know, Collins comes out with a, a, a diverse array of play calls and such. It was just a joke. I wrote it at one in the morning. I thought it was stupid. Collins gives it a shout out in his intro press conference. That was like, <laughs> I, I know, I, I feel weird just like, you know, having myself up like this, but it was really, it was really exciting just to see that happen. I was like, man, that was fun. I never thought I'd get a shout out like that. But I mean, yeah, shout out to Cade seriously for finding that. And, and Collins has leaned into it, so it's it's the Waffle House era more than anything, and I think um, every tech fan can appreciate that because we've all had at least a couple dozen late nights at Waffle House. Well, this is why you not only watch Georgia Tech this season if you're not a tech fan, keep up with them in Jeff Collins year one, but just as importantly, this is why you go to FromTheRumbleSeat.com to keep up with everything happening in Georgia Tech athletics. They also set trends in, in recruiting in, in Waffle House and set what their head coach is going to do. You guys you guys got it going, and you can follow them on Twitter at FTRS blog. Nishant, where can, uh, where can they find you besides from the Rumble seat? Truthfully, I never made a Twitter because anyone listening probably got it now. I'm not good at condensing things, but yeah, I mean, you know, reach me on there. Like, I'll read and respond to comments. So that's probably the easiest way. Hey, you're making a smart choice by by logging off of Twitter forever. I, I wish I could be like you, but make sure to visit from the rumble seat.com. Follow them on Twitter at FTRS blog and find all of Nishant's work there. Hey, that was, I did not expect to get that story out there at the end. That was awesome. That I think was a fitting way for, uh, for us to cap this episode and want to thank you one last time for joining the show. That was a lot of fun. Thanks so much, Colton. It's been a pleasure. Thank you to Nishant once again for joining the show and everybody over it from the Rumble Seat. They do fantastic stuff. Keep up with them as college football season gets closer and Georgia Tech undergoes this brand new regime. I, I think it's super fascinating to see how every coaching transition happens and how it shakes out, but especially in ones like this where you're just undergoing such a dramatic change that the program in essence, just kind of has to be rebuilt, even if it wasn't teetering or bad in the first place. You're just you're changing so much up with the way that the way that the program was run before that you kind of just have to blow it up. So we'll see what tech looks like this season. I don't think it really matters in year one, and that's easy for me to say as not a fan. But I think that Jeff Collins is going to get a lot of leeway, and I am just excited to see what what he does in that area. And like Nishant said. There's a lot of challenges that come with that job, but Jeff Collins seems like the type of guy who is very focused and has a strong identity for what he wants to do and what he wants his programs to be, not only on the field, but off the field too. I hope I did Georgia Tech fans justice in this episode. I know Nishant did. He did a hell of a job on that one, but I hope that Georgia Tech fans and non-Georgia Tech fans were able to listen to this one and get some enjoyment out of it because I had a lot of fun recording it. If you did enjoy it, please subscribe to the show and leave some feedback. Go to Apple Podcasts, search the Two Straps Podcast, subscribe, leave a review. There will be new shows posted up every single week as we lead up to the 2019 season. I feel like I'm rolling right now. I'm really enjoying this. I hope you guys are as much as I am and I will be around all off season and we're only getting closer so I think these episodes are only going to get better and you can also interact with me on Twitter at Dubsco and find the show on SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash two stripes pod. Something I said on the show last week and I'll say again here too is I also have a YouTube channel filled with awesome college football highlights from players past and present including 16 minutes of Dwayne Jarrett from USC, 18 minutes of Percy Harvin at Florida, and then guys from today like uh, Kendrick Rogers, Texas A&M receiver, had that crazy catch against LSU in 
overtime in that seven overtime game. Also had a big game against Clemson. There's also some Ohio State stuff if you're interested in that. Malcolm Jenkins, Chris Gamble, Mike Doss, Chris Wells. And there will be a lot more to come, especially from players from the past. I know Georgia Tech fans, this is probably the wrong base to be talking to, but if you just like watching CJ Spiller, I might have something for you here in the next couple of weeks. So it's youtube.com slash Colton Denning. Keep up with all the highlights I post there. I post the show to the YouTube page as well. So you have no excuse. If you like the show, you can find it on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, wherever. I'm I'm everywhere. That's enough of my shilling, though. I will be back next week with a new episode, another season preview. Don't know who it's going to be yet, but I feel like we're rolling on these right now and we need to keep it going. So hopefully we'll have another fun and good interview for you guys to listen to, and I hope that you stick around. But until then, I want to thank you one last time for listening. My name is Colton Denning, and this is the Two Stripes Podcast.